members of our beloved contaminated and only spaceship which since we last met on the TV has spun around its imaginary axis and of course it keeps on generating events in full development and in this series of shows that I have called and that have had a huge repercussion we have another additional one obviously we have somebody a guest on our map and we have a very important guest mr. director if you can show him on camera Daniel Jose Quintero Alvarez audiovisual producer radio producer documentalist photographer he has degrees in journalism and investigative journalism in Venezuela he has a degree in Colombia in he has won an award Aníbal Nasoa 2016 for his documentary called Conexión Cúcuta Aníbal is part of the national newspaper as well and he was nominated to the Festival Latinoamericano Caribeño for a documentary in 2012 with his film called Una Verdad Escondida. He is an author of the following audiovisual works, Nicolás Maduro, President in Difficult Times. What is happening in Venezuela? Si uh, War Without Limits, Objective Venezuela. He has been distinguished with various awards and recognitions on behalf of civil and military institutions in the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. Welcome once again, Daniel, and without any further ado, you have the floor. Because you are not only here with a lot of information to share with us, so I hope to listen to what you say and not really interview you. And overall, he comes and he is going to be the person that's going to be here. And he ran over here and he's sweating a little bit. And I thank you for that, for coming here, because I know what you're going to say is explosive and the floor is yours. Good evening, Professor. I want to thank you once again for your invitation. And I want to thank you as well for always being a professor, for always being a guide and a light towards our path which always gives us the correct path for all of us that are political journalists. You are a lighthouse that we have to follow whenever we are transversing in the international communication, which is lacking throughout the world. And it's lacking in the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela, the international communication to be there. And we are in front of this, in front of the very few people that are living the good fight with international communication in favor of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela and all of its inhabitants. Effectively, we were in Colombia shortly, once again in Colombia. It has been more than 15 visits that we have had in Colombia over the last three years. Exactly, in the 6th of November of this year is our 5th anniversary of having begun our investigative work at a journalist level in that country, which is an investigative work which we have been documented with the Conexión Cúcuta serial with the ABC of Economic Warfare, when we really did not understand what this term actually meant, economic warfare. And nowadays we keep on explaining this, we keep on giving definitions, and one of the reasons for us being here is to do this. All of the attacks that happen in Colombia that people on the streets do not understand. They do not understand what economic warfare translates into or financial warfare because we have to remember that this is a limitless war. Everything that's happening in Venezuela currently, we have had the opportunity to document this and we realize that it is warfare which has been very well planned. It has no limits absolutely in any single one of the aspects, in diplomacy, in technological aspects, in telecommunications, their psychological warfare, financial warfare, uh, sanction warfare. We have seen during the last year that this has happened, but this is all a part of the limitless warfare that I'm talking about. And financial warfare translates basically with a very big base of operation that has been enacted in various countries and counties in Colombia. 
and Venezuela, for example, in San Santander or Cúcuta, to be able to put it into works. The north of Santander is extremely important because it has over 2,000 exchange houses where people operate freely with the Bolívar from Venezuela, which they have contraband. They have blocking lines and uh, they do very big seizures of the Bolivar, Bolivar, but they keeps on going towards the borders. And I think that it is not far-fetched to say that the majority of the cash that should be flowing in the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela is at the north of Santander, that province of Colombia, because in any exchange house, if one wants to look a billion bolivares, one can do that. You talk about one billion bolivares, you can do that without any problem. Yes, without any problem whatsoever, because we have seen this, we have documented this, and we have been able to record this as well. When we were in Colombia shortly, we were there a couple weeks ago, they changed a thousand dollars in cash for 2.2 million bolivares, and they would give them in bills, in notes, in cash, without any type of complication. If they do not have the cash available, they simply request it, and you can see at the north of Santander and Throughout that city, where there's a lot of exchange houses, we are able to see in Z Zero Avenue or in the terminal or very close to the border, you are able to see very big wheelbarrows or some type of transportation with wheels which carries great amounts of bolivares and generally in wheelbarrows you say yes in wheelbarrows because it has become very lucrative in order to be able to use the Venezuelan cash in order to launder all of the operations that are done in illicit manners in the north of Santander and here we have contraband of gas of medicine of gas, of natural gas, which is strictly necessary not only in order to be able to move the cars from Cúcuta and further yet, because let's not remember that this is an added value for the elaboration and preparation of cocaine. And let us also not forget that Colombia is the biggest producer of cocaine in the planet Earth. And they are strategic allied of the biggest consumer of planet Earth. Yes, absolutely. You are absolutely right. I think that something that's very particular with regards to this is that the vice president with the vice president of Álvaro Uribe Vélez when he was the president of Colombia when Álvaro Uribe Vélez was there his name is Francisco Santos he is also related to Juan Manuel Santos the president that is leaving on the 7th of August and this is an irony that they're called saints in Spanish it's an irony like this yes absolutely it's just an irony of life but precisely this man that was a vice president of Uribe Vélez is going to the United States and he is becoming the ambassador of the new government of Iván Duque and it's not, it's just a representation, a puppet of the real government that is behind Colombia, which is Álvaro Uribe Vélez. Their campaign manager said, with one of the first discourses that they said, once they were able to win the elections, and we cannot say that he won fair and square, because we have seen that this is a lot to be desired, particularly in the first round, there were so many fraud that was there, and the organizations like the OAS also received these type of things, and they have evidence of there being fraud. It wasn't only a suspect of buying votes, of uh, forging votes or manipulating the acts that were present there. For example, they used to change if Ivan Duque had received or had lost in one of the electoral tables with Gustavo Peterros 19 votes to two. Immediately, what they would do, they would simply put a line and they see that Ivan Duque won 102 votes to 19. We were able to see this first town in what the OAS already stated. Even the international organizations that they trusted and they referenced whenever they attacked Venezuela said that there was fraud. Then there was a declaration once Ivan Duque said, and she said, do not forget that the main person behind this is Álvaro Uribe. And she said that 
very, very clearly and directly. And what we are able to see, obviously, we do not want to be negative with that, but we have to be very aware because everything that we have been living over the last couple of years have been attacks from Colombia to Venezuela. And there are 2,000 exchange houses in North Santander that are working with the Venezuelan Bolivar, manipulating the currency, the cash currency, in order to launder cocaine money, the dirty money of the trafficking of gas, for example. Therefore, the Gulf clan has a laundering machine and this huge laundering machine has a detergent and this detergent should be in the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela because what they use as a detergent to launder their money is what we legally use in the Bolivarian Republic as our cash. However, they have taken the task in order to launder their operations, to launder their contraband and their illicit operations with the Venezuelan Bolivar, buying cars, properties in Venezuela, completely disappearing the cash flow, and they have the Republic in disarray because it's extremely difficult here to go and change a check for a million or two million Bolivars. It's completely impossible. However, once you cross the border, you go to Colombia and you have Villa del Rosario, which is a border town at the north of Santander, one can very easily receive suitcases of money, of cash flow, if they so desire, and if they have the pesos or the dollars available, or any other type of merchandise that they require, for example, contraband of goods, of medicines. Let us not forget that the cost of Colombia are extremely high, the highest in the hemisphere in Colombia, Health is expensive. So we have a big amount of elements that have been going from border to border from the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. When we started this investigation work, Professor, in 2013, we thought that it was extremely strange how the people moved around with a lot of money in their pockets. And in the north of Santander, in Ureña, in Tacheri, in Venezuela, in San Cristobal, the people used to work with huge amounts of cash. And then for 2014, cash started to disappear in the state of Táchira. In 2015, there was very little cash. It was very difficult to obtain that money. And in Barinas Portuguesa, we have seen that it had started to extend. And nowadays, we have seen how that evil that was born in that border, and this was calculated beforehand, and they never realized how it could reach these levels, but we were able to see it firsthand. We could say that we were in the machine room of an Olympic-sized pool, and we see how there's a hole in the middle, and that's where water left. And in our case, it wasn't water, but also cash money and a lot of elements, because it was not taken into account, because here, in the country of Venezuela, the reserves were at an optimal level. There was a flow of capital, there was no sabotaging at this level that is occurring right now. We have a deceleration of the private sector or deceleration of multiple companies, multinationals that were in Venezuela. We have more than a hundred holdings that come from the United States and live in Venezuela who have stopped production in order to start generating a bad feeling together with the mass media and with this whole department in Santander in order to hurt Venezuela. And in 2015, when we did our documentary Conexión Cúcuta, when we talked about Colombianization of Venezuelan economy, we said that economy was becoming very Colombian. And what we meant with this is that it was going to be similar in the price range. The prices in Colombia and Venezuela were going to be exactly the same. When you change them to pesos and bring it back to Bolivars, that was going to be the market. And precisely, that is what has happened. When you divide half a pound of coffee, a thousand pounds, you use the formula in the exchange rate at the day, immediately you have the price that coffee costs here in any place of Venezuela. That's why prices are so high, because prices have become Colombianized. Same thing happened to sugar, to milk, with the cleaning and toiletries, with auto parts. So all of the prices have been Colombianized. And this has been a way which has been camouflaged in order to make our economy dollarized using this surgical 
limitless warfare methods that Venezuela is living. So we have a Colombia that has not collaborated with Juan Manuel Suentos and the eight years prior with Dr. Barito, as you call him, Uribe. And this man, Uribe, has been eight years and now Juan Manuel Santos eight and these four new years that we will have to live with Ivan Duque who is yet another puppet of Álvaro Uribe Vélez. And right now, Professor, we are confronting a panorama that's very difficult because they will keep on attacking us. The Mafia has reached the highest pinnacle of its power. You have the paramilitary at its highest level, drug dealing at the highest level, the drug dealing that needs added value from Venezuela, like gasoline, the best gasoline on planet Earth. They re need the, some types of materials from PDVSA in order to elaborate their product, in order to then send it off to the wide world. Right now, in the border in Cúcuta, you can buy one kilogram of cocaine and $1,500 or $2,000. And that same kilogram, when you buy it in the United States, costs $50,000. In Europe, costs 50,000 euros. $60,000 in South Africa, the same thing, and China, which has a capital punishment with drugs, it could cost $100,000. So it's very lucrative. That also gives the GDP of Colombia. And that's why the added elements that are produced by Venezuela are so useful for the Colombians, particularly with gasoline and uh, Chemicals and agrochemicals are also very useful for the Colombians, and they require them in order to be able to take them and process them in order to be able to elaborate their main export product. Because we have to say that Colombia produces many other things as well. They produce agriculture, they produce other elements. However, their main product from two decades ago has been the fabrication and the processing and exportation of cocaine. This is very difficult, Professor. And these people, they have the country in their grip. Yes, sir. We cannot say that they are a brother country anymore. Is there not something that represents solidarity, worry? In other words, the establishment is completely taken a hold by criminals. Because there's not a single politician that has not been tainted by this. I met one of them. Ricardo Galán, who was murdered, yes, he was murdered by the establishment, yes, he was here, and I cannot say this enough, and he said, I'm going to attack them, and this is my personal number, and if I do not do this, you call me, and you say that I did things wrong. I'm not going to repeat this anymore, because it is an absolute shame. The only person that went against the establishment was killed. Yes, with Pizarro case, the case with Manuel Cepeda as well, who were the father of Ivan Cepeda, the congressperson, and also a candidate of presidency who were murdered, and obviously a couple of other ones, like José Lerciel Gaitán, who was also murdered. Gaitán's death indicates a huge chapter which was terrible. Precisely nowadays in the election, they tried to attack Gustavo Petro in Cúcuta, they tried to kill him, they shot him, and there are elements in the police that were involved in this attempt, that moved the cars that he was driving to the place where he was going to be shot. And the car where he was was protected with specific uh, windows that did not allow the bullet to go into the vehicle. But this indicates that the people that are responsible for the cars left the route as well, so they had something to do. Yes, they left and they were guided by the public. You have the videos that they recorded from inside and they say how the police kept on moving them towards the ambush location. This is absolutely disgusting. Yes, and this is the level that we live in right now. We do not expect anything different for Colombia. I wish they would be different. President Maduro is going to wholeheartedly try, as he always has done, to have a dialogue. He has done this in Venezuela, and he is going to find the diplomatic channels in order to do this. But what has been happening with Colombia, particularly with the same President Chavez, let's remember this. 
Of course, Professor, Professor, you were in one of those lists to be murdered by the paramilitary that they brought in 2004. Don't tell me this. Don't tell me that, that I had that huge honor. They had told me in the military aspect, and I did not believe them. No, yes, you were in that list because there were a lot of people who were in 2004 brought, and let us remember that it was in the referendum, the recalling, in the impeachment referendum, when they dismantle this first phase of the operation where there were more than 80 paramilitary forces here in the state of Miranda, which were protected by the governors, protected by the mayor of Delgatillo, and they were brought by a brother of an actress that is extremely famous during the 1980s, Maria Conchita Alonso. Mr. Robert Alonso had an hacienda there and he was quite the character and not in a good way. And there were elements from the DAS that were bringing in the paramilitary forces. The DAS from Colombia, they just walked in. We had Jorge Noguera, who was director of the DAS. He was in charge of that operation. And according to what was said by the ex-director, which was condemned, of IT and the IDIS, Rafael Garcia. Rafael Garcia said that Jorge Noguera was aware of what was happening with that operation with the paramilitary forces in order to attack the Palace of Miraflores and then to be trying to attack certain figures that represented some type of danger to them. And at that point in time, Jorge Diaz was the director of the DAS in the north of Santander. Then they changed Jorge Diaz in order for him to be in charge of dark operations in Venezuela. Then that man, Jorge Diaz, who was a paramilitary element, because let us remember that during that time, we have the self-defense that put the directors, even the directors of the hospitals. And this is true, right? Yes, this is true. I thought that this was a rumor. No, Professor. This is confessed by the man known as Carlos Tijera, who was murdered then. He was in paramilitary forces. He was a chief, a commander of the banana sector. He murders a friend of Alvaro Uribe of the banana zone. He was a mayor. He orders his execution, and then an army did not follow that order that was given directly by the general Marco Montoya. So General Montoya, who was the commander of the army, was in the self-defense of Colombia. In other words, the paramilitary ones. In other words, there was a pyramid of an institution that should guarantee law was included in paramilitary activities. They were the chief of the false positive forces. So here the self-defense forces put the directors of the hospitals in conflict sectors. They had to go through their filter. They put up mayors and they took the DAS and took complete control. They put this man, Jorge Diaz, to be the director of the DAS in the north region of Santander. Then they moved him to dark operations in Venezuela, and mysteriously he was murdered in Táchira, in La Fría, Táchira State. And his death was very suspicious. And what did they want to generate starting from 2004? They wanted to generate terror in Venezuela. Their first operation did not work, but then they achieve an objective, a military objective, which was very important. And in this case, they murdered the attorney general of Danilo Anderson. In 2004, let us not remember, in November 2004, and it was a monstrous, horrible thing that happened, something that was not seen before in Venezuela. I was in a mission, and when I realized this, I said, this has come from our bordering country. This modus operandi does not come from us. The explosive came from Colombia, and that's completely known. It came from Colombia. Every the operation was planned in Colombia. The DAS was aware of this. And who did the DAS respond to this? They had a bulletproof car. The DAS responded directly to the President of the Republic, Álvaro Uribe. And one has to say this. Perhaps these things may affect in certain organizations, in certain cells that are present here, but we have to make this aware. Danilo Anderson, the Attorney General, was a candidate to become the General Attorney General. 
he was doing their, his postgraduate in the UPOL, he was a strong candidate to substitute, once the period had finished, to the Attorney General Isaias. He could have become the new Attorney General and led that new organism. And he was a superstar. He was very well respected. Yes, and his motto was Venezuela with no untouchable people. And he was very direct. He had the support of the president of Commander Hugo Chavez at that moment. And he is brutally murdered in 2004. Then there's a thing that came into account which was extremely important, and we realized this over the next couple of years. And once we are able to review with this conspiracy against the Venezuelan state and against the Venezuelan society, was uh, the Attorney General Luis Ortega Diaz, who right now is in Colombia. She lives in Bogota. She lives in a golden exile. She is received in many times by the ex-president Álvaro Uribe Vélez, and we are aware that he is linked to drug dealing. We are aware that he is linked to paramilitary, not now, of many years back. We have to remember this mega laboratory that they had and that was dismantled in the year 1984, if I'm not mistaken, Professor, in 1984. And this was the laboratory of processing in cocaine, which was the biggest one in the world. There was a helicopter of Álvaro Uribe's family. And Álvaro Uribe has so much power up until now, and he has not been taken to justice in spite of having close to 30 open lawsuits for different cases of paramilitary activities, illegal spying, amongst many other things. In other words, he is untouchable. This man is untouchable. And once again, he is in power. And anything that's happening in Venezuela, everything that is happening with Luis Ortega, the Attorney General, of being able to free drug dealers, free corrupt public and private companies dealers who did not use the currency correctly and a huge network of extortion that had been created in the judicial power. They freed them. And this is a part of this failed state that started working and we are completely aware that it comes from Colombia and from Colombian paramilitary through their boss, Alvaro Uribe Vélez. We have no doubt about this. This family is so closely linked to drug dealing that the wife of Álvaro Uribe's brother, the wife of Álvaro Uribe Vélez's brother, Dolly Cifuentes, for 15 years, has given to the United States for being linked with money laundering of the Sinaloa cartel. In other words, she was the one that laundered the money that came from Chapo Guzmán. Chapo Guzmán, no less, and she was Alvaro Olives' relative. That's how closely linked his family is to drug dealing. And we really need to understand what's going on there in order to understand what's going on in Venezuela. I always talk about the case that I thought was very shocking. The first charge that um, Dr. Uribe Barito, as I call him, was part of the aeronautics. And the first thing that he did was to authorize 45 private landing strips of airplanes in order to transport the drug. And here is when the empire started growing, and Pablo Escobar Garibia starts rising his own little empire. He starts moving the drugs towards Central America, to Europe, to the United States, and very freely because he has control of all of the landing strips of the aeronautic entity because the director, Alvaro Uribe, gave him the permission. And we have a video. Please, let's share with this, Mr. Director. Presidential elections in Colombia 2018. And we are going to leave that plague. They call us a plague because we are going to defeat him. Let's get together in the constructing a peace which is sustainable, which is incredible. This is your party with Dr. Uribe, who's your boss. With Uribe, have you heard of Uribe? Yes, absolutely. He owns 
Ka uh, sugar canes. He owns Sugar Palm in Colombia, and he owns a lot of things, and they promote a lot of this in television, that they have to eat pig and pork. Eating pork should be done on a daily basis because it's delicious, cheap, nutritional. Eat more pork every single day. What country do we want? We want a country that is devoid of classes. A second Venezuela? No. In Venezuela, I worked for nine years. You did not have documents, but they treated you well, yes? Yes, they treated me absolutely well. They paid me everything that I needed by law, everything that the law said I was paid. Today, we have a very solidarian country with an economy with a Christian vision. They were telling me that nowadays they are moving the sellers off of the streets. When Petro was here, did this happen to you? Never. Absolutely not. Petro would let you do this. He let you work, right? They let you work, yes. In Colombia, only the rich govern for the rich. Yes, because they give money to the rich. The poor do not get anything. Now the minimum salary is miserable. How many days do you work a day per week? Six days a week. Six days a week. How many hours? From 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. Because the transportation went up, and if you travel six days, you have a minimum salary which no longer is sufficient. How can we get food if we cannot buy this? We have two months for the presidential election in Colombia, and we have the polls, which the Uribista candidate is going to be. And Uribe is going to be in the Congress of the Republic. He is going to be the member of the government, and he is going to lead us. The Justice Tribunal in Medellin ordered the investigation of Uribe Vélez. We have to explain why a helicopter of Antioquia was in the place of the massacre of the 22nd of October of 1997 when Álvaro Uribe was a governor of that department. It is not something new. Not only did they kill him, but they dismembered them like a cow. He's a very strong man in order to be able to recover safety, in order to give tenderness to the people of Colombia. We are worried, and we are very deeply worried, the violence against leaders which defend human rights. Colombia closed 2017 with 170 cases of killed leaders. And during the first five months of 2018, there are 67 killed leaders. If the national government does not check the comprehensive compromise and does not take policies in order to prevent crimes and to be able to sanction the responsible parties, it's going to be very difficult that we stop doing this. Nowadays, you get the reports of this, and if they do not rob 20, 30 people, it's a good day. In December, they killed close to 10 people. And why? Because there's a lack of employment. If we had more opportunity, first to study and then to be able to work, there would not be this level of misery. There would not be the amount of people that are thieves, such bad people. Gustavo Petro currently is in the second place with 24%. And Venezuela, if Venezuela collapses, Colombia will collapse as well because of the 4 million of Colombia that live there that immediately would come back. And it would be a humanitarian crisis that we do not have to measure the consequences that would happen. This is the notice. Every year it's the same. And Venezuela is bad and Colombia is beautiful and everything's correct. But Colombia is bad as well. 27th of May, first round of presidential elections. We're hoping to get some type of change in order to be able to support somebody, anybody but Uribe Vélez, who has investigations for close to 276 lawsuits. I have voted for Ivan Duque. This first bulletin, Dr. Ivan Duque has seven 47.23%. I have a big respect for the electoral organization in Colombia. The mission saw that there were votes that were being bought in Bogotá, in Antioca, Bolívar, Atlántico, and north of Santander. Would you like it to be like in other countries where it's electronic? Yes, absolutely. Yes, we need electronic votes. It would be better. I think electronic is the way to go. We need somewhere where is a lot more vigilancy. 
the mission of the electoral says that the candidatures want to put the amount of witnesses to be theirs. The fact that it's manual, it makes the thing transparent. We can change this by a number four, for example, and here we can put a seven here. And very easily, we change that 12 for 722 volts. That's what we were talking about. And we were in an era from the Incan department where we spent a lot of paper, where we can do things differently, like in Venezuela, which is electronically done. So you do not trust in the electoral entity. No, not at all. This electoral debate is between the corrupt machinery and the free citizenship. Both candidates will be have a runoff on the 17th. Investigations prove that Ivan Duque won the first round because modifying the votes in order for his victory. Could Gustavo Petro have won? It is better to have equilibrium, it is harder to have equilibrium of liberty than support the f weight of this. Look at this documentary. It is not the biggest one or the only documentary that has been done about this. And there are small elements here that we did. We have another one of these that we have not broadcast yet, but hopefully we will be able to show it because we have been able to record undercover people that confirmed and they told us in their own words that they were not even registered and they voted. Obviously, this was a part of the first round of electoral votes. Unfortunately, all of these uh, things that were irregular that we were able to see and which were um, reported in Colombia as well was not sufficient enough so that in the second round, in the runoff, we prevented fraud. Here we are able to see how in Colombia, which is a society that pretty much attacks all of its population. Why? Why do I say this? Because they have a VAT which is extremely high, the highest one in the region. The VAT is of 19% in Colombia. The interest rates are up to 100% for loans. And food, which were not exempt from the VAT, they reformed the taxation and they started paying taxes. Ivan Duque, one of his electoral promises is to increase the production of Colombia, but obviously this is closely linked to the raising of the work hours. And Álvaro Uribe says that it is one of the evils of Colombia. Basically, he says that laziness is something extremely bad with Colombians, and that's why Colombians have to work from 12 to 14 hours in order for them to be a lot more productive. That's what Oribe says. And they have a TLC, um, free market agreement, and they have received the blessing of the United States. Yes, correct, Professor. All of the, this was in exchange because they dropped their trousers with seven, now nine, military bases, they gave the sovereignty of their seas and skies and immunity so that the U.S. military can do whatever they want in the territory. That is correct. And everything that has happened in Venezuela over the couple of years, we have detected through our investigative work of being able to recollect information and process the information that we have collected, everything that has happened in Venezuela is strictly necessary in order for the electoral process of Colombia to work in the way it did, to say that Colombia could not be able to vote for something that was similar to Venezuela, for some type of a social discourse that was similar to the one that exists in Venezuela. And that's when I say that they put their bet in order to have an internal conspiration, and obviously it was Luis Ortega Diaz in order to create this idea of a failed state. All of the elements that have happened when she did not pay attention with regards to the money laundering of the banking sector with the permits that she gave to the banking department. From 2015, we have been reporting that they used a private bank as a technological base in order to launder money in the north of Santander with the dollar and the Bolivar. Can you name the bar? Yes, the na bank is Banesco. 
And we have this in our first documentary in Cocuncion, Cúcuta. And in 2014, this was already there. In 2015, it became public. But only now, a couple of months ago, they started an operation which the state called Paper Hands. And this was information which we already processed a couple of years ago. And when we took him to the Attorney General in the 20, 2014, they did not pay any type of attention. So what did this tell us? That she was part of the conspiracy that existed in Venezuela. There were plenty of elements in order to start f uh, making capital flee, and the element that had to be taken care was the legal system and the legal system of Venezuela did not pay attention in order to permit a lot of bad things that have happened. And then Venezuela gave the idea that it was a failed state. And this is the thesis that the United States is interested in. Absolutely. So the campaign is pretty much summarized in this way. A failed state is Colombia, but they bless them. The Americans bless them. Yes, we have seen that Colombia is a failed state. When we started this investigative work in 2013, in November 2013, we really could not believe the amount of homelessness that existed in Colombia in 2013. The amount of families that lived underneath the bridges of the high quantity of people that were on the street. It was young people, women that were pregnant and did not have a place to live. They were... Uh, people that were living outside of the city without any access to electricity, water, or study benefits. And here, in Venezuela, we already went past that very dark stage that they left us in the couple years before, particularly starting from the 90s. And in the 2000s, Venezuela began to handle its own resources in a way which was completely different. And we started having advances with regards to social benefits, with regards to education, university education, primary education, health, obviously. Yes, absolutely. How many Colombians live here? 5,600,000 Colombians live in Venezuela up until now. We have to round down 5 million Colombians, 5,600,000, which is a good estimate. And they are not nostalgic of Colombia. They do not want to return. No, they don't want to return. They say that there is a mass exodus. We cannot deny that people have started leaving from Venezuela towards Colombia, towards Peru, towards Argentina, towards Chile. That phenomena is that has not been discussed a lot. Do you have this data? Yes, a short minutes ago we had data. Up until the last year, there were 3,200,000 people that had left, but more than 2 million people returned. In other words, they leave, they come back, they say, I did not like it, I did not do this, it's not worth it. Yes, plenty of them have returned to Venezuela when they become aware of the realities that happen. They have sold their houses here, their cars here, in order to be able to live. They had bet everything on that. And when they live the hard reality, when they have to pay $150 for electricity and very high water, where they have to use gasoline, which costs 50 or $80, then they start living the reality of other countries. And then after they live that, they tend to return to the country. And this is something that is being processed very little. And obviously they come back with their tail between their legs, and that's sad. Yes, and we know that people have sold their cars, people have sold their houses, that they had bought a couple of years ago with the social policies that were given by the government. So once they live these new realities in other countries like Colombia, where they have very high cost of utilities, and they have to dedicate their whole salary there, and you cannot go to public health services there, you do not have free health care and medication there, not at all. You have to be registered in a way like the way that happened here previously in Social Security. And I want to extend my deepest respect in charge of public health. Thank you for your solidarity. Yes, a couple of days ago, we had Venezuelans that we knew plenty of years in the city of Bogota, and we had to help them. We had to help them ourselves in spite that fact that we were wa uh, traveling with very exact resources, we had to share with them our food with them, we had to share with them to be able to have a collection here 
we had to have a collection plate, as we say, and to be able to leave some type of food for them, our friends there in Colombia. And is there racism or uh, classism against Venezuelans? Yes, of course, because Venezuelans have gone there and they have said that things are not doing well, they're living out of the garbage bins here and plenty of things that are completely exaggerated. They're exaggerating a crisis which is thematic and which we had explained at the beginning, which was surgically implanted and elaborated by certain governments. They have sold the cash in the transportation system of the different cities, but per perhaps the most likely is in Bogota. They sell the cash, the bills of 100 bolivars, 2 bolivars, 5 bolivars, 20 bolivars, etc., for any type of Colombian currency that they can get so that they can have the cash as some type of souvenir. And with that money, they cannot buy anything but the cash is left. And they do not realize that in that same country where they are selling the currency for any type of price that were the guilty party of devaluing and pulverizing our currency with the contraband practices, with the practices of money laundering, with the practices of contraband precisely, of money laundering with regards to drug dealing. And particularly for the Gulf clan, which is the most powerful clan, the drug dealing clan, it is one of the cartels that is the most powerful one. And they don't talk much about this one, but according to the United Nations, it is the cartel that distributes 80% of cocaine that is produced and elaborated in Colombia. And then it is sold throughout the world. They must be very proud about that. And I want to ask you, where is this leading? Are we having certain type of omissions in the way we act? Or are we simply victims of this lack and this institutional complicity of Colombians? Evidently, in warfare, you cannot win only with defense or even with martial arts combats or boxing combats. You cannot win a war that way in order to win defensively. Venezuela has to take measures. President Maduro has had radical measures. Let's remember that in 2016, he took out of circulation the 100 Bolivar bill, which generated chaos in Colombia, particularly in the north of Santander. They would bring back the currency. It was a noble strike. And that bill that was no longer in circulation in 2016, towards the final trimester, once the financial war had started, started coming back. It started flooding back. There were uh, big seizings in the border. And a couple of days before the bill was cut from circulation, they burned plenty of the bills in Cúcuta, they had bonfires at night in Cúcuta in order to burn them and say that they do not care about anything. The president made it uh, a lot possible in order for it to keep on being in circulation. And he had a radical measure right there. And in traditional economy, it would be unthinkable for an expert, for an analyst, for an advisor at an economic level to give to a president. So we have to take more measures in this sense. We have to take radical measures that are unconventional with regards to economics. So we have to have a new monetary cone, but this monetary cone is already being attacked. It is a creature that is being attacked before it is born. So we should not be naive and think that this uh, monetary cone is going to be respected. This monetary cone is going to be devalued. It's what they did with the rest of the monetary funds. We're just repeating the same things. So, yes, we have to prepare something new. And here are some measures that we had thought and we had talked with plenty of people in the borders and we have had consultations with experts here which are experts in the subject, and we have to do a lot more. Not an economic reconversion, we have to have a monetary reformation and a reformation of the salary, not a simple percentage increase. We have to have a radical reform of the salary in order to be able to 
deal with this neighbor that is attacking us. We, if we have to reach the point where we defend us by making it very unattractive to contraband the medicines, making coffee to become very unattractive to do this because what they happened they started they stopped contrabanding because it costs exactly the same when you convert it to bolivars to pesos it's exactly the same and that's why nowadays you have plenty of coffees of different brands why because it is no longer attractive to contraband this with um, pulverized milk is the same thing with medicine it does not happen because the medicine is very cheap in Venezuela and I think that this with regards to medicine is criminal that the Colombians do and with gasoline gasoline prices it's exaggerated just to put an example a couple of days ago we were in Táchira in the province of Táchira in Venezuela we were supporting an audiovisual topic to FAES, the special force of the army, and we did a follow-up to two cisterns and to two tanks that were coming in order to contraband gas to Colombia. There were 38,000 liters of gasoline that's going to be contrabanded. It cost 38,000 bolivars to buy this. In other words, the two cisterns cost 76,000 bolivars to buy. In other words, with a 100,000 bolivar bill, we paid the two systems and we got money. It crosses the line, the border, and it costs $38,000. Please repeat the amount. 38,000 bolivars for two cistern tanks. It would be 76,000 bolivars for two trucks, which are cisterns, which are elaborated, to be able to have a container, their square, of like the vessel ones in order to transport merchandise, which were modified, and they put 38,000 liters of gasoline. And immediately when they put it towards the Colombian border, it cost $38,500. It's more than 100,000 million bolivars at the price that the parallel dollars are. So what is lacking control? a strong hand apart from controls to re-engineer things because the control are there we have block line we have checking lines they're huge investments of the strategic operation of the Ministry of Defense and of all of the structure of the Bolivarian National Forces this allows me to breathe to think about the National Forces we have a lot of military forces which is very decent we saw that the fight that um, General de Sandreo had when he was in La Soy and he was in the central area when they discovered gold mines they were not bought and they are generals which are very dignified of our army and we have a commander which is strategic commander of Remigio Ceballos and we also have Vladimir Parino Lopez and a huge high group that is cohesion and is directed by the President of the Republic. And what direction are they going towards? Towards control, towards fighting against contraband. And obviously, perhaps one of the elements or forces might be bought. We saw how more than 30 professionals were stopped in one of the final stops prior to customs in San Antonio del Táchira. There was army and the National Guard that was present there. And unfortunately, there were young guys that lost a career, but they were bought, unfortunately, by these criminal organizations. And then they went to the competent organisms in order for them to be judged. They lost their careers, the high military forces. Their idea is to fight against these contraband and these illicit things, which are not generating on its own. It's a warfare that has been established and a lack of attention that the Colombian governments have not had in the borders. And what about the Americans? They bless Colombians when they let them use all of their terrain, their seas and their skies. Now with this new agreement with NATO that Putin used to say a couple of days that he did not see this with good eyes, these new repositioning 
of bases of NATO, not only close to Russia, but also to other countries. I'm not mentioning Venezuela directly, but of course they are showing us this and they're showing us that they can do this, that they are putting this um, arm, which is an arm, arms, and the philosophy of the NATO is when they touch a member, everybody has to be do this. So the corruptors, the Colombians, if we have a reaction, all of the NATO supports them. And with this horrible man in the White House, I have not seen such a horrible man with his hand, with his tiny hands on the nuclear button. In order to have some type of an ass in a china shop is offending that ass when we talk about the person in the White House. And they have an establishment. We have an ex-director of the most important intelligent agency of the United States. Nowadays is in charge of international policy. And here we can realize that the vice president, that Alvaro Uribe, is currently blessed in the United States and working there. He is the biggest corrupt man that president, and his vice president will become the ambassador of Colombia in the United States for the government of Mr. Ivan Duque. So we will have a repositioning of forces right there. And we will expect the best, but of course they're going to attack us. They're going to create false positives. They're going to create fake news. And there will be financial attacks on us. And therefore we have to have an engineering of the financial system with different new mechanisms, particularly thinking. Because if we do not strictly think of absolutely everything that is happening in the border, what we should do is to create a multidisciplinary team that can give a follow-up to these elements because absolutely everything that is happening in Venezuela was born in the border between Colombia and Venezuela and it came through the north of Santander. If we do not take into account or if there are no proposals that come from that area, evidently nothing positive is going to happen which will have a real impact and we will have to keep on defending ourselves. So in order for us to be more proactive and give a very strong response, we have to have an initiative, we have to be proactive and we have to be surgical. We have to put in our magnifying glass on every single one of the bad things that happened in our border in order for us to have certain types of measures that really react towards the financial war. This unproportionate with all of the mass media at a national, international level that are being used only to attack the country that has the most energetic resources of the planet. They have all the mineral resources in Venezuela. They're attacking us. So up until this point, the topic related to currency that we talked about, I do not know if you remember the ones that were in the houses listening to this right now. You have one minute. The one Bolivar coin, Bolivar Fuerte coin, the one that is here, started leaving the country. They started taking the country a couple years ago. They paid more money. Remember this. Those in the set say this. They remember this. They paid money for this one Bolivar, and they did not know why. It's just a one Bolivar coin. And it's because they used it in Bogotá in order to forge euros, in order to forge the euros. It's exactly the same size. The Bolivar one is a little bit thicker, which allows you the opportunity to be able to carry out the process of erasing it in order to mint this fake coin, which is a year. Ironically, one Bolivar, with a euro you buy one liter of gasoline in Europe. With one Bolivar, you buy one liter nowadays in Venezuela. But for one euro, they want to sell it in the parallel, close to four million bolivars. And why do we want to make people aware of this? Because once again, there is an attack being enacted towards our currency. The strong Bolivar Fuerte, the sovereign Bolivar, the sovereign Bolivar is exactly the same or similar to the old Bolivar. 
and it's here. So what are these huge mafias waiting for this coin to be minted in order to get it and to start manufacturing forged euros? And then what can they say? They say that this coin comes from the central bank of the government of Nicolás Maduro and they accuse us and say that it's a government that's a failed state, it's a government that is forging currencies in euro, and to be able to find new sanctions against the republic. So we want to make you alert of this and make the authorities alert so that they take into account of what is going on currently or what they are expecting in these big mafias to be able to carry out in order to be able to keep on attacking our currency. Daniel Gise Quintero Álvarez, it was a pleasure to have you here. You are a permanent guest because this has just beginning. Thank you very much, Professor. And if we are useful, you can have this space for you. We know your seriousness, your courage and braveness, and also your sources. So I'm extremely thankful. And I want to abruptly close this because we are over the time, but it was a pleasure to be able to have this. Wherever you may be, thank you for allowing us being there. The floor is all yours, dear Director.